she says, my students often ask about World War III, and I always ask them to think about the wars happening all over the world and if we've been in constant war since World War II, right? This is the, the, the long peace argument we've had as historians. Is the Cold War peaceful or is it actually more militaristic, more warlike? How do you come at that, Bill? If you total up the number of people who die in war or are killed or maimed, so casualties in war per year, per population. So the population of the world is much larger than it was in 1945. And so if you take a ratio of the people who are, let's just say killed in war, that's a good measure, people who are killed in war today as a, every year as a proportion of the world population, it has gone down dramatically since 1945. And not simply compared to World War II, which was, you know, that's a bad place to start because it killed so many people. But if you just start in 1945, it's gone down and down. And in fact, at the moment, I think this is right. I don't, there are not any significant international wars going on today. Wars today take the form of insurgencies, civil wars. And those, there are probably more of, the, you know, def, there are definitely more of those today, if you just count up the number of conflicts, than there were in 1945. But a lot of this has to do with the fact that there are many more political entities today than there were then. So there are 192 or something like that, members of the United Nations. In 1945, there were only something like 35 or 40 of the United Nations. So you get these new countries and people are you know, fighting for power in those countries. So if you count just the number of conflicts, there are more. If you count the number of people who are getting killed, as Spain, in, the only fair way to do it is the proportion of the population. That's gone down. So in that regard, the world does seem to be getting more peaceful. Now, for whatever this is worth, I think that in terms of my competing theories for why no World War III, nuclear weapons has nothing to do with civil insurgencies. Right. Uh, but trade might. I mean, matters of economics almost certainly do have something to do with that. It, it's, it's interesting, and I know you've, you've written uh, about this. You know, one of the interesting arguments often made about nuclear weapons is that they do enable smaller wars because societies with nuclear weapons feel they're safer against someone attacking attacking them. Do you buy into that argument? What nuclear weapons do is they sort of establish this threshold, this, um, well, bright red line, this fire zone between <laughs> sort of small scale wars and going beyond that. And so when the United States has been to war, focus on the United States, when the United States went to war in Korea, there was a moment in late 1950 where Harry Truman talked, accidentally talked haphazardly about considering the use of the atom bomb, as it was then known. And it set the world entirely on edge for, for very good reason. When a president of the United States starts saying we might have to use the atom bomb, then the world should get nervous. Right. That was the first time that people thought really seriously, okay, this is it. This is World War III and it's gonna be fought with nuclear weapons. There were moments during the 1950s and there were crises over the Taiwan Strait, over Berlin, um, and of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then if you get into the Middle Eastern War of 1973, you know, the, when the world gets close to war, at that point, as long as we were in the framework of the Cold War, where there was this understanding that a nuclear war is gonna go big really quickly and therefore, quite clearly, nothing in Korea is, warrants waging World War III against the Soviet Union and all of its nuclear weaponry. And likewise, these other ones. So, as it pertained to the Cold War, then perhaps nuclear weapons really did, they might have allowed the Vietnam War, for example, to become bigger than it would have otherwise. Because Soviet leaders, Chinese leaders could know, the Americans realized what the upper boundary is. They're not gonna take it beyond that. Since the Cold War ended, we don't know. We're 30 years now into the post-Cold War period, and we really don't know what the rules are. Right. I don't think anybody has a handle on what might prompt Kim Jong-un to use nuclear weapons, or, or what might prompt the use of nuclear weapons between India and Pakistan. Right. Because we just, and this is new ground. Right. And, and great... the other thing is, I think there's no longer the automatic linkage between, let's say, a single use of nuclear weapons and World War III, right. the way there was during the Cold War. So it's not inconceivable that Pakistan could fire a small nuke at India, and India would fire one back, and that would be that. Right, right. I, and, and just uh, building on that briefly, I mean, as, as I understand it, Pentagon war planners today, their, their biggest concern about a nuclear 
conflict is exactly what you pointed to, uh, India, Pakistan, that boundary, and, and it not being world war, but being a really, really bad regional war. So in fact, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about in the document section. We're going to be looking at the non-proliferation treaty. Right. So we'll come, we'll come back to that yeah. there. Uh, we have a lot of great questions from the teachers. I want to get to those just relevant to where we are. Anthony and a bunch of other teachers ask about uh, the doomsday clock on the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Is that still, is that still uh, useful today? What, what do you think? I think it's really outlived its usefulness because you can't live at 1157 or 1158 for 50 years and still get the attention of people. Right. You know, the sometime that clock is going to have to strike midnight and the fact that it hasn't. And I think it really lost purchase on the, the world's consciousness when they set the clock back. I mean, it was very nice to hear that they had set it back, but one would have thought they should have set it back to you know, nine o'clock in the evening instead of to 1150. It right. really, it does begin to sound a little bit like, you know, the kid who calls cries wolf. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I agree with that. Uh, Teresa Russo and a whole bunch of teachers have has, asked questions and had a really interesting dialogue about the overlap between your discussion of technology and many of the things that David Oshinsky talked about on Tuesday, especially with regard to McCarthyism, right? And how have concerns about secrecy and anti-communism uh, interfaced, uh, particularly around the atomic scientists. That's where the questions were asked. But of course, these continue. In the 1980s and 90s, we had concerns about Chinese scientists, right? I think today we still have many of those concerns. So, so how do you see those two issues coming together, Bill? There is something inherently unnerving to a lot of people about science, especially branches of science that for national security reasons are classified. It's one thing not to know how my iPhone works. But if you don't know what's going on at, uh, you know, at Los Alamos, and you don't know who knows what about nuclear weapons, it's a little, a little bit, maybe it's a lot easier to get concerned that there are people in the know who are pulling strings on the rest of us. And there was a time when the Pentagon and presidential administration still by and large had the confidence of the American people. And so when Dwight Eisenhower, when President Eisenhower said, basically, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Most Americans were willing to grant him the benefit of the doubt. After all, he had won World War II in Europe for the United States, so he presumably knows what he's doing. Even then though, there were people starting with Joseph McCarthy, but other people who said, you know, there are spies in the world and they're giving away all of our knowledge. Now, in fact, there were spies, so they weren't entirely wrong. There weren't as many as McCarthy said, and they weren't as ubiquitous in the State Department. But when there is this thing you don't understand, it's very tempting to think that there are other people who do understand it, and they're going to use it against me. And we can come right to the present when various uh, of the software companies, the, uh, I guess Google and maybe Facebook, are, or maybe it's Apple, they'd have these tracking technologies. So we can see who you've been near. And so if somebody that was near you comes down with coronavirus, we will be able to do this. And people don't like the idea of somebody, somebody having this knowledge they don't. And when there are people who do have this knowledge and you don't, it's very tempting for those people who are disposed in that direction to spin conspiracy theories. Right. And so, you know, if, China goes communist at a time when the United States has the atom bomb and the United States is the most powerful country in the world, then somebody must have sold out Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists. That simply couldn't happen on its own. And this was, this was a consequence of something that Americans kind of talked themselves into to their own, to their own uh, in, op in opposition to their own self-interest. And that is the United States was the world's leading power from 1945, really arguably until today. Its advantage over the rest of the world has diminished over time. But there was a temptation to think that because the United States was the most powerful country, the United States was all powerful. And therefore anything that happened in the world that posed a threat to the United States could have been stopped if the United States is simply, if the president, if the Pentagon had been aware, had been interested, been willing to take it on. And that was always wrong. The United States, as powerful as it was, was never all powerful. And so 
things would happen to the detriment of American interests that the United States could not do anything about with a reasonable expenditure of effort. But it was very easy and tempting for people to criticize whatever administration was involved at the time for letting that bad thing happen. Right. That's a, that's a great connection to what Marianne Heiss was talking about yesterday and the exaggerated expectations of American power and, in fact, the limited, uh, limited effectiveness of American power in many situations, both military and technological and economic. Right. Um, on this topic, Bill, um, one of the big debates often, of course, among historians, but also among policymakers, is to what extent is innovation driving technological and economic change, and to what extent is the stealing, the espionage, the stealing of information, right? This could be in the military sector, but it could also be in the economic sector, concerns about China doing that uh, yeah. today, right? So to, to how, do we how do you think about that as a historian? The temptation to steal innovative ideas has been, ar been around as long as there have been innovative ideas. So the American textile industry was built on stolen secrets from the British textile yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. And if it works in your favor, usually you're, okay, this is great. If it works perhaps to your detriment, then mm -hmm. you're opposed to it. And here one has to distinguish between national interests and particular corporate interests. And this is one where America's marriage of capitalism and democracy uh, sometimes works in, to the benefit of democracy and sometimes not. And so if you had to describe the United States in two words, so the United States, the American system, American culture, it's the two words are democracy and capitalism. And most Americans are willing most of the time to think that capitalism and democracy get along okay. But in fact, when Apple computer, well, General Motors famously, famously said by the Secretary of Defense, formerly Chairman of General Motors, that he thought that what was good for the United States was good for General Motors. The terms, the, the order was often switched around. He did not say it was good for General Motors, it was good for the United right. States, but that's the way it often came across. But anyway, um, in a lot of cases that is true, but in fact, corporations are trying to, for the most part, trying to maximize their profits. And if this works to the benefit of the United States, all well and good. And for the most part, historically, it's probably a reasonably good approximation. But there are times when that's not true. But you sort of can't count on the patriotism of corporate leaders. They'll do what's in the best interest of Apple or whatever it might be. Of the other thing is that on this subject, there is plenty of opportunity for scapegoating. So some, and this comes up, I, I said, that the general principle of American economic policy since 1945 has been free trade. But it's not been exclusively free trade. And there are times when the United States itself has gone back on its free trade principles. So in the 1980s, when there were lots of imports of Japanese cars to the United States, the, the American automobile manufacturers went to the Reagan administration, went to President Reagan and said, these Japanese imports are killing us. And what they were doing is they weren't killing American uh, consumers. The reason that there were so many imports of Japanese cars to the United States was American Auto buyers love the cars, but big industry was able to persuade the administration that it is in the interest of us, and they would say our workers, that we put a lid on Japanese imports. So one of the things, this is true of discussions of nuclear weapons as well, but even more so in the case of international trade. So these are really complicated things, and you never, they're never a single cause. So, I said that globalization was something that the United States pretty much enthusiastically embraced until about 2000. But starting in around 2000, American administrations have backed up. They haven't pushed so hard in the direction of continuing to reduce tariffs. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that there was the hollowing out of American industry. And some of the jobs that had been in textile industries and been in automobile industries and been in other industries did go overseas. So what had been produced by textile mills in North Carolina was now being produced in Bangladesh. And some of the things that had been produced in American electronics firms in New England was now being produced in China. But a lot of the job losses were due to automation. But rather than blame automation, because you can't, get, you can't very well get the government to act against automation. Nobody had yet come up with it, the idea right. of taxing robots. But you can blame foreigners. And you know, the, you don't have to scratch very deeply into the American psyche, or for that matter, anybody else's psyche, to find a little bit of xenophobia, to blame foreigners for problems in the United States. And of course, it's really tempting 
for officials in a democracy to do that. Because you can blame foreigners all you, all you want, and foreigners don't vote. If you blame people in the United States, well, you're going to alienate a potential constituency. So, so Bill, just building on that, there's a, a wonderful set of questions about free trade. Um, uh, Deanna and others have, are asking, um, how do we understand this concept of free trade? Are we moving away from it? Uh, what are the implications? I guess one of the ways I would put the question is, to what extent was the United States pursuing free trade? You mentioned GATT and then, of course, the WTO. And to what extent, even within a concept of free trade and globalization, were there limits? Uh, limits about security issues, but also continued tariffs to protect farmers and things of that sort. Right. So free trade is something that every American administration from Franklin Roosevelt's through certainly Bill Clinton's endorsed. George W. Bush liked the idea, but didn't push the next round of free trade talks. There have been various rounds that have been going on from the 1940s. Didn't really push very hard because there was a lot of pushback in American political circles. But still, the idea that trade is good, so even through the Obama administration, the idea that trade is good for people uh, was something that the American government was willing to endorse. And although there were, there were always debates over extensions of free trade agreements, if you look at, so NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was negotiated in the early 1990s and was adopted in, I think it was 93. And then there was a, a Central American version of that that came, that was uh, negotiated and then came online in the, I guess it was the second half of the W. Bush administration or thereabouts. But the, the principle was trade is good. And the way I talk about this with my students is I just say, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you, how many of you know for a fact? that you are wearing an item of apparel that was made in the United States. And in a classroom of 400, I might get three or four students will raise their hand. And, and, and I say, I just ask them, since you did raise your hand, um, how do you know that and why? And because, well, I like the idea of stuff that's made in America. Okay, that's fine. But the fact is, and, if, and I point out that if I had asked the question 50 years earlier, I'm not quite old enough to have been teaching 50 years earlier, but 35 years earlier, the question would have been very different. And so, so why has that change occurred? And I, when student, and I just pose the question to my students, again, I don't ask them to explain why they bought the underwear that they're wearing that day. But the point is that consumers, American consumers have made this decision collectively by the millions, the tens and hundreds of millions over the years, that we get better stuff at a better price if we buy it from somewhere else. Yeah. And so there's been always been that pressure that, that it's a bit of, it's a very quiet pressure and it's a pressure that doesn't, that's hard to mobilize politically because when textile workers, when automobile workers feel that their jobs are threatened, they're a discreet body of people and they know exactly what they're losing and they're losing a lot. So if you were an auto worker, a steel worker, if you're a steel worker and you lost a good middle class job, that was, that's your livelihood. And you can count it up in the tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands over the years. Whereas if you're the consumer of the steel products, you're, the steel that is in your car was just a little bit cheaper. You hardly notice the difference. So there's an imbalance in the political forces acting on a government on trade issues. But as recently as about 2010, or whenever the Central American Free Trade Agreement was negotiated. It was, I mean, I knew some people who were involved in negotiations. They said, you know, the votes against these things are just, they're votes that aren't gonna matter because the organizers, the trade rep for the administration, they've counted the votes and they let certain people vote against, sure. but they always have the votes to make it pass. That's no longer true. Right. Now, we don't know, and it's really not true under the current administration. And one of the things that I've been telling my students about, so what do we make of the changing approach to foreign policy under President Trump? And my answer, and it's a dodge, and we historians use this dodge all the time, that it's too soon to tell. But we will be able to tell when we know the outcome of the election in November. So if President Trump gets reelected, then the American people operating through the rules of the game by which we elect presidents will have said, we like your approach. And this will be a clear rejection of the principle of free trade. 
because President Trump came in announcing that he was opposed even in principle to free trade, leave aside just the complexities of negotiating individual cases and carves out for agricultural products and the like. Now, if President Trump does not get elected, reelected, then it's gonna be hard to tell. And in this regard, and, and those of us, Jeremy, you've studied the presidency more than I have, but in this regard, we know that presidents are as much symptoms of the political culture as they are shapers of the political culture. So the, the forces, the influences that gave rise to President Trump's attack on free trade, he didn't make that up himself. So they're still gonna be there. And so it's, you know, it's hard to tell exactly where we are. So when I uh, once again cite Brands' fourth law, which says sooner or later countries get the foreign policy they can afford. And the sooner or later in that is really important because there's a lag time between right. what you can afford and what you're gonna get. And it works on the upside. The United States could have had the most assertive foreign policy in the world in 1900. The United States had the most powerful economy in the world by 1900, but Americans still had the sort of small America expectations of the 19th century. Now, it remains to be seen if we are sort of running on fumes in world affairs now, that maybe Americans still have the expectations of a really big and ambitious foreign policy, but we no longer have the political clout to afford it. And so this is, this is where we are. And as historians, we sort of know where we've been, but we don't have any better idea where we're going than anybody else does. Well, and, and, and you, you also reiterated one of my rules of history, one of my laws of history, which is that presidential elections usually tell us what the American people are against, not what they're for. Yeah, and, and unfortunately for those who are in the business of you and me, they almost never turn on foreign policy. No, exactly, exactly. But economic policy, which is yes. why your, your, your yes. point about this election and trade is I think a very, very appropriate point. Right. Um, swi switching directions slightly, uh, we've got a great set of questions here from Hannah, uh, Hannah Howard and a whole bunch of teachers about which technology from the space race had the greatest impact on us today. It's a question I often get as well. Uh, Hannah says that she actually asks students this. They have a lot of fun with this question. Water filtration, home insulation are some of the issues she suggests. What do you think, Bill? What, what came out of the space race that changed American lives the most? This is not something that had been discovered or implemented by the time Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. But it, was, it came out of that same culture. And I would say the GPS system. Hmm. The fact that we know where we are at any given moment, at any time. And it makes possible everything from Uber to Amazon's deliveries to maybe self-driving cars to planes that can land themselves. So I think that's the, the biggest, the biggest spin-off of the space, the whole space business. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, and as a consequence of GPS, now my teenagers don't know how to get around anywhere if they don't have a phone. Right. They, they, they don't know how to read a map. They, they don't know how to read street signs. Everything is about their phone now, wherever they go. Right. And the concept of when I will give directions to somebody and say, you, you go east from such and such. Right. No idea. <laughs> no idea. Um, OK, we have um, a question about, from Keith uh, about the INF and SALT treaties. Uh, how much do you attribute? Uh, the treaties to changing uh, international politics and reducing nuclear tensions, or were these just obsessions of the time that don't seem as relevant for us today? The INF Treaty is one that is a case that I'm going to look at because I think it's really interesting and it demonstrates, one could argue, well, it's often interpreted as it's demonstrating a change of heart in Ronald Reagan. Yes. Because Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980 on a platform that said in part that the United States had allowed the Soviet Union to take advantage of the United States during the period of detente. And the United States had become inferior nuclear weapons and other weapon systems, and the United States needed to catch up. And right. so Reagan's first term was all about building up America's nuclear arsenal. But then in the second term, after building it up, he begins to negotiate it down. Now, I think there's more continuity there than was often seen. I think Reagan understood that the way you get the attention, in this case of the Soviet Union, is to make clear to them what the consequences of a continued arms race are gonna be. Now, this is interesting because you mentioned that my early research and early books were on the Eisenhower administration. And I recall John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, in a memo to Eisenhower, I believe it was, and it was about 1954, and he said that you know, we need to build weapons as fast as we can because the Soviet Union can never keep up with us in an arms race. 
Well, as of early 19, the early 1980s, this wasn't true. The Soviet arsenal was a match of the United States. However, it's not implausible to say that it actually proved true in the end because one of the reasons that the Soviets came to the bargaining table in the mid and late 1980s was that the arms race was breaking the Soviet bank. And Mikhail Gorbachev realized that he could not reform the system if he got into an arms race if the United States, especially if the arms race went into outer space. So maybe that's true. And, and this is a reflection, I think, on how one, how one judges policy, let's say in the Cold War, but the policies of any president or, or any government. How much time do you give these policies to take effect? So Jeremy, you're old enough and been in this business long enough to know that Harry Truman, now neither of us are old enough to know directly, that Harry Truman, when he left office in 1953, was the most unpopular president in American history. His approval rating was 22%. That was below what Richard Nixon's was at the time Nixon resigned under pressure of Watergate. And for the, for the rest of the 1950s, Truman was considered this failure and the Democrats didn't even want to talk about it. His, his um, reputation improved a little bit in the 1960s as it became clear that a standoff in an Asian war wasn't the worst you could do, that right. the United States actually could lose an Asian war. Right. So the outcome in Korea, I mean, assuming the outcome in Vietnam makes the outcome in Korea look better. It makes Truman look a little bit better. And then, of course, there is that afterglow that surrounds presidents once they're no longer in the crosshairs of the opposing party. Once Truman leaves office, there's no point in Republicans beating up on him anymore. But the real re-evaluation of Truman came in the early 1990s. And it came with David McCulloch's book, with Lana Zohambi's book, and, and other people who wrote about Truman. And they're able to write about Truman from the long-term perspective of America's triumph in the Cold War. And it was basically on Truman's terms. Because Truman's policy, the fundamental policy of containment said, we don't have to fight the Soviet Union to defeat communism. All we have to do is be firm and patient. And that's exactly how it played out. So by the 1990s, it was clear that Truman's policies had been right, but his reputation had been in the cellar for a long time in between. So when we look at, say, you know, Reagan and arms control, and so Reagan was counting on the fact that the United States could outspend the Soviet Union and eventually the Soviets would come to that realization. As of 1981, the Soviets might think, ah, American interest in pursuing the arms race is flagging because Jimmy Carter, at least until the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, was, he was cutting the defense budget post Vietnam. And so they could, think, they could think, okay, we can get and maintain this edge without exorbitant costs but it didn't turn out that way. So then that's when things really turn, I was about to say permanently, but we historians know that nothing ever changes permanently, but there was a big change. So for the, the INF treaty was the first treaty that eliminated an entire class of systems. And then the, the start treaties after that dramatically reduced the arsenals of the superpowers, which ironically then, maybe it makes the risk of nuclear war greater because it means that the arsenals of the third and fourth and fifth and sixth nuclear powers are larger by comparison. Yep. If any small power knows that it can, is gonna be blown away, if the United States and the Soviet Union each have 50 times as many warheads as they do, then they're not gonna start anything. But if the big powers have fewer warheads, maybe the smaller powers or are more likely to start something, knowing that the superpowers can't waste weapons on this small scale thing. Right, right. It's, it's interesting. I, I just wrote a review of John Bolton's memoir, and this is a central issue for him. I mean, he really doesn't like the INF treaty. It's interesting how it, how it comes back today. We are just about out of time. I just want to